but we can still go to the round tables and uh, make sure you've got some good separations. Uh, advisable. And we can visit together and have meals together. It's a, it's a special part of, of country church community. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you a quick joke. Three little boys had show and tell at school. And so they each brought something. They had, they had their day when they could do show and tell. And, uh, the little Islamic boy brought his prayer blanket and he explained to the class that five times a day they kneel down in their prayer blanket and pray. And the Jewish boy, when it was his day to show, he brought one of those candlesticks with the seven, what do they call them? Menorah. He explained about that. And on the third day, the little Baptist boy came. And he had a paper sack with something in it. And everybody was waiting to see what the Baptists have for show and tell. So he pulls out this big, long, rectangular thing. And he says to the class, this is our casserole dish <laughs> so we can't have a country church without without some eating together breaking bread together so come next next sunday at 12 you don't have to bring anything you can bring something if you want but just share it with a table where you're sitting we're not going to do a buffet so uh while the worship team is coming up, uh, let me pray to open our service today. Dear Father, we so enjoy being with each other. Uh, the fellowship of kindred hearts is like heaven, I'm sure. So all these smiling faces here, we're together and we love it. And we want to raise our voices together to worship you. The whole reason we come here is for you, Lord. So put in our hearts a spirit of worship. Help us block out all the things that we could be thinking about, what we're going to do tomorrow, etc. Help us focus on you. And may we have a genuine uh, spirit of worship for, towards you. In Jesus' name, we ask this blessing. Amen.
I wandered so aimless, I filled with sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Just like
stand for singing, so why don't everybody stand and do a quick stretch? <laughs> We're trying to keep it cool in here too, so we don't you don't fall asleep on the guy preaching, alright? You can sit down whenever you're ready. Just trying to keep you awake, so. Well, it's going to be a little bit of a, I know we got a glorious fall day, but our passage we're coming to is going to kind of force us to uh, look at something a little bit, you know, the subject of uh, suffering and difficulty. And so that's going to be where we're going to, we're, we're going to turn today. Have you ever been uh, bitter toward God? Uh, ever resented Him for something He's allowed in your life? Um, I was, this is a few years ago, there was a, a Christian I was talking to, a friend of mine, and um, he was describing a friend who was battling cancer, and I said, well, how's the guy doing? How's he, how is he? And uh, the word he used was resentment. He said, they resent it. They resent this, that God's allowed in their life. So, which is understandable. I have felt that in my heart. I felt Bitterness toward God, anger, resentment in my heart toward God, certain things He's allowed. I mean, you're in control, Lord, and this doesn't feel good, and I don't like this. I don't like it at all. Um, so our study, as I said, in Ruth today, in chapter 1, as we come to the end of that chapter, is going to put us face to face with this issue of suffering, bitterness, resentment, and that, that struggle we can feel in our hearts toward God when hard times come in life. And so when he allows us to go through the furnace of affliction. So here's where we are in the story, just to catch us up, um, kind of refresh our memories, or if you, you're just joining in for the first time. Um, there was a famine in the land, verse 1 of Ruth 1, and that was a disciplinary judgment of God on his people who, who had turned away from him. And so this famine in the land forced a difficult decision on one Jewish family, a man named Elimelech and his wife Naomi and their two sons. And so there's no, they're, they're having a hard time getting enough to eat and they decide they're going to take their family to Moab. They're going to leave the promised land and they're going to head to nearby Moab. And as they're there, when, once they get there, Elimelech, the husband, dies. And so Naomi, the wife, is left with these two boys to raise in a foreign land in Moab. Eventually the boys grow up to marrying age and they marry two Moabite girls. They marry these foreign wives. And then both of the boys die. And so these three widows are left together, a mother-in-law and two daughters-in-law, wondering what are they going to do, trying to pick up the pieces. 
Well, about that time, word comes from Israel that God had visited his people, the famine's over, he provided food, and so Naomi decided, I'm going back. And so last week we looked at verses 6 to 18, and this word that kept coming up over and over and over is the word return or turn back. It was just repeated. And so she decides she's going to return. And both the daughters-in-law, one is named Orpah and the other is named Ruth, are determined to go with Naomi. So she starts on the road back, and they're going with her, they're walking with her. And Naomi at one point turns and says, you need to go home. You need to stay in Moab. Your prospects for a husband and a life there and happiness there are better in Moab. With your people, with your family, you need to stay. Turn back from following me. And finally, after much convincing, one of the daughters-in-law, Orpah, says, okay, and she turns back. But Ruth, the other daughter-in-law, won't have any of it. She clings to her mother-in-law in in love and says, no, I'm going to stay with you. And so then we get this famous statement in verses 16 and 17, this beautiful statement of Ruth's love and commitment to her mother-in-law. Ruth says, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you, for where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And so she is going to leave her homeland. There's this radical she, God has put faith in her heart and there's this radical change of course in her life and she's going to go to the promised land and the Lord is going to be her God and she's leaving the foreign gods of Moab behind and her family and she's pledged herself to Naomi, I'm never going to leave your side. And to that Naomi says in verse 18, she can't say anything. She's determined to go and so they journey on. And so that's where we're going to pick things up here. Chapter 1, verse 19 of Ruth says this. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? So the town, there's a buzz in town when they show up. There's an, uh, the town's humming, there's an excitement, and you can almost picture kind of word being passed, word of mouth in this little village, like, Naomi? Now, if you look back at verse 4 of chapter 1, it tells us that they were in Moab 10 years. And I think that means the total time since they left, maybe it's the time from the time the boys married the wives, I think it's the total time, So they've been there at least 10 years gone. So, I mean, this is the day, I mean, no motorized transportation, no cell phones, no email, no internet, no social media. I mean, you leave and they don't hear a word from you. I mean, nobody's heard anything for a decade about what's going on in their lives or even alive. So, I mean, imagine you had a friend and they leave this valley and they move to some far off land where you have no communication somehow and you never hear a word from them for 10 years. You don't know if they're alive or dead or what's happened in their life. And all of a sudden, you're just out and about and you're doing your business and you bump into them out of nowhere after 10 years. Like, whoa, it's you. I mean, a lot can happen in 10 years. Think back to the last 10 years of your life. 10 years ago, I was a 34-year-old bachelor living in an apartment with my brother next to First Baptist Church in La Grande in town, Park Manor Apartments, two bachelors in their bachelor pad. Now I'm 44. I've got a wife. i got four kids, ages 21, 18, 7, and 5. We've had... Two miscarriages, well, we've moved, bought a house, had two miscarriages, two births, a pulpit search in town, an interim pastorship. Um, what else has gone on? A health scare. Battle with depression that lasted for months. Two high school graduations.
a job change. I work here now. And a whole bunch of other stuff to boot. I mean, that's 10 years. Think back 10 years in your life. A lot of stuff happened. So they've been gone. Nobody's heard a word about them. And people are shocked. I mean, all of a sudden, here she is. And so the question in the end of verse 19 is, this thing owe me? Like, whoa! Out of nowhere, she suddenly shows up. Now, so they're surprised to see her, but I bet part of this question is, this Naomi is, her appearance has changed. She's 10 years older, and she's had three deaths, and all the stress that goes with that, she probably looked a good deal older. I think that's part of the reason for the question, too, is her appearance had changed. And so, is this her? To which Naomi cheerfully responds, Yeah! Good to be back. I, man, it's good to see you all. Verse 20. Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. The Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full. The Lord brought me empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity on me? I bumped into you. Good talking with you. I mean, I mean, what would you say? You see this old friend after 10 years who suddenly shows up in the valley and is that you? And this is the response. Uh, you probably got a footnote in your Bible there uh, that the, the name Naomi means pleasant. So her parents give her this name. It was a pleasant gift from God and they want her life to be pleasant. So pleasant or pleasantness, and the footnote, you probably have one by the word Mara. The word Mara means bitter. So I've changed my name. My name's not pleasant. My name is bitter. Call me bitter. My name's Mara. Uh, and here's why she's bitter. Here's her fourfold accusation uh, or testimony about God. She says, the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full. The Lord brought me back empty. So that, I mean, her family. I mean, she had a husband and children, and now they're dead. Uh, the Lord has testified against me. So she views God as her accuser, as her judge who's called her to account, as a witness almost in a courtroom judicially, who's testified against her. He's her accuser. She's the defendant. And the Almighty has brought calamity on me. My life is a disaster. And He's done it to me. And so she refers to God with a couple different names there. One is the Almighty. It's the word Shaddai. So it's the all-powerful one. The one who is the ruler of of the cosmos, and then the Lord, His covenant name Yahweh or Jehovah, His personal name. El Shaddai, the Almighty, the Lord, He's the one that's done this. Uh, he's crushed me. What do you think of her theology? Do you agree with it? What do you think of her interpretation of the stuff that's happened in her life? Is she right? She is right in this. She ascribes total sovereignty to God. Absolute sovereignty and control to the Lord, to the Almighty. So look at these verses. I mean, it's kind of amazing what, what God will say. Isaiah 45, 7. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Amos 3.6 Is a trumpet blown in a city and the people are not afraid? Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? Job chapter 1 Verses 21 and 22, Job says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, 
In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. He's making a true statement. God gave and God took. Psalm 105, 16 and 17, when he summoned, he is the Lord, he summoned a famine on the land and broke all supply of bread. But he had also sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, referring to the story of Joseph, who was sold as a slave. And those are kind of tough verses, aren't they? Uh, about this, what Naomi has to say here, uh, John Piper says this. He says, I would take Naomi's theology any day over the sentimental views of God that permeate so many churches today. Endless excuses are made for God's sovereignty. And God doesn't make any in his word. I mean, he just flat says, I'm in charge. So Piper goes on and he says this. He says, thousands of Christians who have walked through fire and seen horrors embrace God's control of all things as the comfort and hope of their lives. It is not comforting or hopeful in their pain to tell them that God is not in control. Giving Satan the decisive control or ascribing pain to chance is not true or helpful. When the world is crashing in, we need assurance that God reigns over all. That this is not out of his hands. That he can turn it for good. And so Naomi's right here in attributing total sovereignty to God, complete sovereignty to the Lord, to the events in her life. That is good theology. She's right about that. But, but what's the problem here with what she has to say? For one thing, there's no... She doesn't leave any room for human causation. And we said, the trip to Moab, that was not a great call. Marrying foreign wives was not in accordance to God's will. And even more importantly, while she ascribes total sovereignty to God in all this, it's a sovereignty without any grace, any room for grace here, right? It's just this hard hand. And it's because she's hurting. But it's justice without mercy, it's sovereignty without grace. It's power without compassion. And there's, she's got this part right. He's almighty. He's sovereign. But he's gracious. And he's merciful. And he's kind. And he's good. And she seems to not have that in sight right now because of what she's dealt with. Which is understandable. So in the midst of when I was going through the depression struggle. And some of that was, you know, my own, there's some fault in there of my thinking, but also my brain wasn't working quite right and uh, functioning properly. And so, and so in the midst of this dark cloud of dread that's in your head, and it's not getting better, and there's no relief I struggled with this. I felt bitter resentment toward God. I, he seemed aloof to my pain, right? Like, I'm praying and nothing's happening. Uh, like, he's unkind, like he doesn't care. So, I was mad, like, Lord, you saved me. And since the day you saved me, I, have, I really have tried to live my life for you. I, I've, not, I've tried to be obedient and I've tried to serve you and I've tried to live for you and this is what we get in our lives? How is that right, God? How is that good? What good is there in this? So all this is to say that when we're facing hardship, um, there's a place for honesty uh, in our struggle, honest communication with God. Um, there, you know, there's an honest way to, kind of a respectful, um, there's kind of a reverent, respectful, righteous way to complain. You know, to say, God, can you change things in these circumstances? Uh, so the Psalms are filled with these, right? If you've read the Psalms, there's these honest conversations with God. So here's one example. Psalm 10. 
And it starts just like this. Verses 1 and 2. This is how the psalm starts. It just, boom. Why, Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursues, pursues the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes they have devised. So, I don't know if the if this is David, I don't know, writing this, and he's the one being pursued by the wicked, or if he's seen others pursued by the wicked, and he's like, but the wicked are doing these evil things to people, and they're getting away with it. God, why aren't you doing anything? Why are you standing back and letting this happen? Why are you hiding yourself in this trouble? Do something here, Lord. So there's a place for honesty in these struggles. Um, and yet at the same time, we know there's a line, right? That we don't want to cross into this bitter resentment where we start accusing God uh, irreverently. You're not good. You're, you know, we're bringing an, an accusation against him that's not true. So somewhere in this depression deal, a friend here at Homestead gave me this book, The Gospel According to Job. An honest look at pain and doubt from the life of one who lost everything. So, if you'll let me, I was going to read a couple lines out of this. So this guy says, Did I get angry at God during my struggles? You bet I did. I once slammed a door so hard that the molding shattered. I got far angrier with God than I have ever been with any human being. I do not defend this behavior. He's not saying, yeah, that's how you should respond. He just, this is what happened. This is how I felt. This is, I don't defend this behavior, but in the course of it, I did learn that such feelings are not incompatible with faith. On the contrary, faith involves our deepest passions engaged by the reality of God. The person of faith is one who, like Job, knows what it is to be torn apart by the enormity of God. Just the presence in Scripture of a book so dark, chaotic, and thoroughly eccentric as Job should come as an immense comfort to any sufferer, suffering believer. For the book says, in effect, this is what faith is often like. Do not be surprised if you find yourself confused, doubting, afflicted, all but crushed. It does not mean you've lost favor with God. So Naomi's kind of in that place. He says this too. The real question is whether I myself, in my own unique set of circumstances, what are your circumstances, what's your struggle, whether in that I'm giving glory and thanks to God from my heart, if I am not, then it makes no difference whether the problem I face is a big thing or a little thing. The point is whether one's own particular burden is being born in the bitterness and pride of the flesh or in the grace of God. Let us not get trapped into comparing lots, whether in terms of troubles or blessings. So I was talking to Heidi, and she said, you know, when Jeff died, that, and when we're, we've got hard times in our life and things are not good, one of the things we can tend to do is we look over the fence and see so-and-so's life, and we go, it's like smooth sailing for them. You know, and we want to trade places, or you know, why me, and why do they have it so easy, and this is what's the hand you've dealt me. So he says, let's not get trapped in comparing lots, whether in terms of troubles or blessings. Whatever our trials may be, we are not to begrudge them. But neither let us make the opposite mistake of underestimating or belittling them. They are real struggles. Jesus did not sing sprightly choruses on the cross. He hung there and suffered. You know, um, Spurgeon, the great preacher from the 1800s, he had uh, gout, uh, rheumatism, Bright's disease, which is an inflammation of the kidneys. Uh, gout is, is related to arthritis. It's this painful inflammation in the joints. It can be excruciating that attacks the joints. And so this came on in his life when he was 35. It, this gout first attacked him. He's 35 years old. And it, it, it was with him the rest of his life. It lasted all life long. And so the last 22 years of his life, of his ministry, a third of it was spent, he couldn't preach. 
because he was laid up, dealing with the gout or recovering from the gout or trying to prevent the gout from coming again. And so in 1871, a couple years in, it was really bad, like so painful he couldn't stand it. And so this is what he said. He said, when I was racked some months ago with pain to an extreme degree so that I could no longer bear it without crying out. I mean, he can't stand it. He's, ah, you know, hollering out because of the pain. I asked the people watching me to leave the room. And when I had nothing I could say to God but this, this is what he said. This is his prayer. Thou, you are my father. And I'm your child. And you as a father are tender and you're full of mercy. I could not bear to see my child suffer as you make me suffer. And if I saw him tormented like this as I am now, I would do what I could to help him. I would put my arms under him to sustain him. Will you hide your face from me, my father? Will you still lay on a heavy hand and not give me a smile from your countenance? So I pleaded. And I ventured to say when I was quiet, they, and they came back who were watching me, I said, I shall never have such pain again from this moment, for God has heard my prayer. And he says, I bless God that ease came and the racking pain never returned. God didn't completely take it away, but he did take some of the pain. It was much more bearable than it was in that moment. So I think that testimony combines a good honesty, honest complaint, a respectful complaint, uh, a righteous complaint. It's, he's being honest, but not slipping over the line into bitterness there. So Naomi here has slid over the line. She's bitter. Call me bitter. The Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. And the bitterness, because of it, she's temporarily kind of blinded to the blessings that God's brought in her life. And you might say, well, what blessings? I mean, she's lost everything. For one, she's got this daughter-in-law who's come with her. And the Lord's done a work in her life. And Ruth has this incredible faith. And Ruth has pledged to stay with Naomi thick and thin no matter what even though Naomi's not a lot of fun to be around right now. This is the testimony later in Ruth at the end of the book in chapter 4. This is what her friends say to Naomi about Ruth. Ruth 4.15, they say, Your daughter-in-law who loves you is more to you than seven sons. Like, what a blessing in your life. And so her statement in verse 21 where she says, You know, I came back. I went away full. I came back empty is not completely true. You're not totally empty. It's a little bit of a slap in the face to Ruth, right? Like, Ruth's right, right there. Like, you're not totally empty, but she can't see it. The other blessing is that God's brought food and the famine's ended, and she's come back to their land with the covenant people of God. And so in verse 22, Naomi returned, Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who came from the country of Moab. They came to Bethlehem, at the beginning of barley harvest. So, barley harvest, it's late April, early May. It's a beautiful time of year. And there's food. And the harvest is about to start. And so she's got these blessings of this daughter-in-law who loves her and who's never going to leave her side. And there's food now. And so God has already started to bring blessings in, but she can't quite see them yet because of, of the hardship she's been through. So, suffering is suffering. There's no easy fixes. And... There's no like magic answer that just makes it go away. At some point, at some level, it just has to be endured as we wait for God to deliver us in His timing. But there's some things we can do to help ourselves. Because one of the things um, suffering can do, difficulty can do, is it can become, it can kind of take on a life of its own and become this all consuming thing where. Like, it dominates life. It just wants to dominate all of our view of life, and we can't see any of the good things. All we can see is this. All of life is viewed through this thing. Uh, and so it wants to consume all the thoughts. And so what was bad, what maybe is really hard, can become ten times worse because 
of our outlook on it. I mean, it's almost, the fear and the anxiety about it is almost worse than the thing itself. So, what can we do to help ourselves? I don't know. There's got to be somebody in this room or watching who's got a, a really hard thing right now. What can we do to help ourselves? Uh, one thing is just count, count our blessings. Uh, that goes a long way. Uh, it's just, there are good things. As bad as it is. A pleasant meal. A day like this. Uh, when the rain has come and the air is cleared and we got this crisp fall air and the sun's out this beautiful time of year. There's family and friends in our lives who love us and are with us. There's, there's the Lord and His salvation. So if we can start to put our attention on some of those blessings and give thanks, it helps us. So thankful people don't become bitter. The second thing that helps, uh, and I tried hard to work through this when it's easier said than done, but um, embracing what we know to be God's purpose in this difficulty, whatever it is that we might be going through. So, the hard thing about that stuff is we don't know the end game, right? We don't know the outcome. And so we want it to just be fixed and get better. And we don't actually know when that's going to be or what that's going to look like. or We don't know God's will or outcome for it. And it can be easy to try and focus on that and make, kind of somehow make it happen and get there. And we can't do it. And so taking our focus off trying to fix that and embracing what we know is God's purpose in this trial. What do we know is His purpose in trial? One thing we know for sure that we can bank on. He wants to form, for His child who believes in Him, He wants to form the character of Jesus in us. He's going to conform us to the image of Christ. He's going to form Christ in us through this. So there's no growth without adversity. And so he's going to produce growth in our character if we walk with him through this. So Romans 5 says, we rejoice in our sufferings. Now, it's not that we're excited about suffering. It's hard. We don't rejoice that it's hard. We rejoice because we know what, there's something good on the other end. And what's good on the other end that we know for sure, regardless of the outcome physically, we know that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character. So God's going to use this to shape our character to be more like Christ. And character produces hope. Hope in the gospel, hope in the Son, hope in eternity. Our hope gets detached from temporary things here and on to eternal things that can't be taken. And hope doesn't, that kind of hope never puts us to shame, never disappoints. God's given us the Spirit. His love's been poured in our hearts. So we know that purpose of God in suffering. And so try, it's easier said than done, but trying to embrace that. Like, you've got my growth in mind, and I want to embrace that purpose, Lord. So Hebrews 12 says this, My son, my daughter, don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Be weary when reproved by Him. The Lord disciplines the one He loves, chastises every son whom He receives. It goes on and says this, it's for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. He disciplines us for our good that we may share in His holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Yeah, it's painful. Right now, it's painful. It's not pleasant. Later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. See the purpose of God in that? Like He's doing a tra- now. This isn't necessarily discipline that's corrective for sin. This is just, you know, you sometimes give your kids challenges or hard things to do, and they're like, "I can't do it," and you say, "No, you're going to do it." Please let me out of it. You know, no, no. You're going to do it. Why do you do that? Because you're just mean, jerk of a parent? I want to make your life miserable. That's why you were born, so I could make you miserable. Didn't you know that by now? Surely you figured that out. I, ha- I gave birth to you so you could be my slave. 
No. Right? Love want right. We know if every time I'll give you a hard thing to do. No, I don't want to. Okay. What's the end game of that? You're gonna be a spoiled brat. We don't want to be around you when you're an adult. Nobody's gonna be want to be around you. It's for your good, ultimately, that you have to do this hard thing now. It's because I love you that I'm going to say no and make you do this. Because it's going to produce character, some righteousness, a peaceable fruit of righteousness in your young heart. So you're not a spoiled brat. And our Heavenly Father, same thing. But here it is, right? To those who've been trained... By it. So there's a, if I just stomp my feet, no, and turn my back on God in some final way, there's a way there's a, where I have to submit my will to His and embrace this purpose of training somehow. And that's not easy. So that helps us if we can trust His heart in the difficulty. And then the last thing and the most important thing always to say about this, the answer always to the problem of pain and to suffering is always what? The ultimate answer is always what? The cross of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's the ultimate answer. Remember the cross. You're suffering. Jesus, the Son of God, suffered. Hebrews 5. In the days of his flesh. Okay, he's on the earth. The Son of God leaves heaven. He's on the earth. He puts on skin to live like a poor man from Nazareth. He is the King of glory, the creator of it all. It starts with that. I mean, that's no picnic. He offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. I mean, that's, that's hard times. He's, God help, Father! To him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. God raised him up. Though he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Now Jesus was never disobedient in terms of sin, but what's in terms of his humanity, and this is mind-blowing, right? He, he's the Son of God, but in terms of his humanity, he has to learn greater and greater obedience. I mean, here's, your, you know, you give your kid when they're five, uh, would you go feed the dog? Now when they turn 12, it's, you know, I want you to mow the grass, and today here's your list. Gra- mow the grass, take out the garbage, and I want you to weed the garden. Right? So the, you, the obedience steps up as they get older, and that's kind of the idea here. Through suffering those, through difficulty, and being made perfect, not that he was imperfect, but it's that growth of character in his humanity He became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. So, if we look to Jesus in faith as His children, God's going to take us on the same journey that He took His Son on, which is going to involve some training, which is going to involve some difficulty. And if we can embrace that, it will help us. So here's Christ, the Son of God. He takes our place, the place of sinners who have sinned against God, who have turned their backs on God, and the suffering is not just the physical pain, it's not just the whipping and the thorns, and it's not just the nails, it's even more so the wrath of God, the justice of God, the righteous punishment of God that we deserve poured out on Him. He takes that ultimate suffering so that we can be God's... children forever if we trust Him. And so whatever happens here, whatever it is, and it can be excruciating, is not to be minimized. Whatever it is is temporary compared to this eternal glory that God's prepared for those who love and trust Jesus. So there's you're going through this dark tunnel. There's a bright light of glory at the end. And there may be, there's probably some other light in this life, even before that, but we know for sure there's that light of glory, and the sufferings and struggles now are not worthy to be compared with what he's got planned. So, God's taken Naomi. I mean, this is hard, right? Husband, two boys. 
That's a hard trial. The Lord is taken away, and she's become bitter. And her bitterness has temporarily blinded her to the blessings of God. But God's already started to bless her. This daughter-in-law, the barley harvest. And what if she could see down the road to the end of this story that God had planned for her, that God had a plan, a purpose in her pain? What if she could see that this daughter-in-law is going to marry a man, a godly man, and that from that marriage, she's going to have a grandson? And that that grandson is going to be the granddaddy to King David, the greatest king. So in her line is the greatest king Israel's ever known. And what if she could see even further for God's purpose in this, that her family line is in the line of redemption, that out of Ruth, eventually is going to come Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the King of Kings, the ultimate King. And so God had this incredible purpose in her pain, and things were looking up already. She just couldn't quite see it yet. Okay, I realized that, that was kind of long. I had a lot to say. There's a law in my heart. Closing song here. Um, this song was written by a guy named William Cooper. Uh, some of you might know that name. Uh, it's the song God Moves in a Mysterious Way. We've played it here, but it's been a few years, and this is a new version, a really cool version. Cooper was a contemporary, a friend of John Newton. John Newton was the slave trader that God saved who became a pastor, and John Newton's the guy that wrote Amazing Grace, that hymn, and a bunch of other hymns. Well, John Newton was a friend of William Cooper's and helped Cooper because Cooper suffered from lifelong depression and despair. I mean, he, he had a hard time in life. He really struggled. And so Newton wrote a bunch of hymns, and William Cooper wrote a bunch of hymns, and this one, God Moves in a Mysterious Way, is, is a, probably the best one, one of the best, one of my favorite songs of all time. If Facebook, the copyright thing might cut it off for the people at home, go to YouTube, look, search the song God Moves in a Mysterious Way, look for the one by Crossroads Music. There's a bald guy with a beard and his acoustic guitar and a lady with her cello in this old church. You, you want to watch it because it's really well done. So, Jackson, can you do that for us? God moves in a mysterious way His wonders to perform Plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. And deep in unsearchable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will and ye fearful saints press courage take the clouds you so much dread I'll be with mercy and salvation in blessings in blessings Judge not the Lord by feeble sins, but trust Him for His grace. Behind the frowning providence, He rides a smiling face. His purposes will ripe and fast unfolding every hour So much dread, I'll 
Blind unbelief is sure to err And scan his work in vain For God is his own interpreter And he will make it plain In his own time In his own way Isn't that a beautiful song? The words are just awesome. Uh, let's pray. Father, you are uh, you are in charge, Lord. You are the Almighty. You are the Sovereign One. You are righteous, Lord. You are good. You are gracious and you are merciful. You are tender with us, Father. And yet you allow hard things, but it is in your love that you do it, Lord. We confess that, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would help us especially those amongst us who are struggling, who are going through the furnace right now, whom you are refining as gold, Lord, that you would help them, God, to lean on you, to trust your time, to trust your way, that you would protect them from the evil one who wants to attack them, Lord. And they would feel incredible comfort from your spirit, that you would pour out your spirit on them. And that you would bring them through, Lord, and you would deliver them. And they would be better for it. And their faith would be stronger. And they would love you more. And out of it, Lord, a ministry would be birthed to others. Help them, Lord, to embrace the gospel, God, to rejoice in the good news, to to cling to Jesus and take hold of the Savior, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that this is our anchor, Lord. That you are in control. You can change things. And that you care and that you're near, Lord. We give you praise, God. Help the struggling saints today, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Love y'all. If you need talk, need somebody to pray with, find a friend, find one of us. We would love to be one of those means God uses to help one another. That's why he that's why he put us together in the family of God. So we'll see you again.